Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Elizabeth and I film true crime videos. I'm going to be filming a solved case today, although it was actually a solved case that was not solved uh, quickly after it happened. It took around 15 years before the case was actually solved. Before I tell you more about the case, I wanted to say that although this is quite a high profile case, the reason that I wanted to cover it is because I actually know the area that the case happened in super, super well. Um, I spent a lot of time there, so it was quite interesting for me to do my research. And yeah, I feel like knowing the area makes reading about the case so interesting, um, even though it's always interesting. It just gave me that a bit more personal factor to it as well. Without further ado, let's just get into today's case. So today's case is going to be about the murder of Rachel Nichol. Rachel Nichol was born in 1968 in Surrey in England and she grew up in a small village with her parents John and Monica Nichol and her two sisters. Rachel was a driven and intelligent woman and she was actually modelling at the same time as trying to pursue her career as a psychiatric nurse and Rachel particularly wanted to work with patients suffering from eating disorders. So in 1989 Rachel actually began studying at the University University of Surrey and this is where she met a man named Andre Hanscombe and the pair began dating. Andre was working as a fitness instructor at the time and Rachel and Andre fell deeply in love and moved in together not long after beginning dating and they moved into a flat in the Tooting area of South London. Their flat was located on the top floor on a quiet street and it was close to a few different parks and green spaces and Tooting anyway is a highly diverse and vibrant part of London with many different shops and cafes so there were always things to do. Rachel was always finding things to do as I said like having the green spaces and stuff they could go on walks, try out different cafes. It was definitely not short of different things to do, I guess, a lot more vibrant than Surrey, for example, which is a little bit more pushing towards the countryside. Only a few years later, in the early 1990s, Andre and Rachel became parents to their son, Alex. Although they were absolutely over the moon and they loved having a child together, of course, they were also young and parenthood came with its own struggles as well. And I think it was hard for them to adapt at first to being young parents and facing financial financial struggles of course and also Andre facing his own struggles with alcoholism. Although this did place some pressure on their relationship and of course was not the easiest situation to navigate, Rachel and Andre remained strong throughout this time in their life and they were just committed to raising their son Alex together. And so after having their son of course as I said Rachel was studying to become a psychiatric nurse at the time but she decided to put this on pause just for the first kind of few months slash years of Alex's life just so she could focus mostly on being a mother although she did later return to her degree. Rachel also had a love for fitness and would often go on walks with her son Alex. As I said they had so many kind of green spaces around them so they were really wanting to utilize this and that was exactly what they did on the morning of July 15th 1992. Rachel and Alex embarked on a walk of a nearby Wimbledon Common which is a common located nearby the village of Wimbledon village. It's quite an affluent village. It's very famous for uh, its tennis, Wimbledon tennis of course. So that's where they decided to go on their walk. It is definitely a beautiful area of London and I assumed that the pair would feel safe walking in this part of London. This was also a popular destination for families. They would expect to see other mums, other children at this common and so Rachel really loved taking Alex on walks there. So they arrived at the common at around 9.30 a.m and they spent some time in the Sampa area which was a bit more open before later embarking on a walk along the wooded path. Soon after a passerby noticed two-year-old Alex alone crying and covered in blood so of course went to see what was wrong or what had happened which is when they discovered the body of Rachel Nichol. Rachel had been stabbed 49 times and she suffered absolutely catastrophic injuries and was pronounced dead at the scene. Rachel's son Alex had been left completely unharmed and it seemed that the focus of the attack had mainly been placed on Rachel. The attack towards Rachel was highly brutal. As I said, she was stabbed 49 times and so of course this 
shook up the community and the country as a whole, knowing that such a violent predator was on the streets. Upon analysis of the crime scene, a number of things were discovered, suggesting a sexual motivation of Rachel's murder. Rachel was actually found undressed and had been sexually assaulted, which of course does suggest that whoever had murdered Rachel had a sexual motivation for doing so. A set of footprints were also found at the crime scene leading away from Rachel's body and these were analysed and found to be matching to a pair of Nike trainers. Blood stains were found on the grounds around Rachel on nearby trees and these were all of course taken and analysed in an attempt to find some other DNA evidence. Witnesses also came forward reporting seeing a man kind of lurking around the area that Rachel was murdered and one witness actually reported seeing a man walking away from Rachel's body although this could never be confirmed due to the witness not being able to provide a detailed description of the person that they had seen. Cigarette butts and a pair of sunglasses were also found at the scene of Rachel's murder and again were later analysed to try and identify a DNA link to a potential perpetrator. Semen was also found on Rachel's clothing which when DNA analysed was found to match DNA on the cigarette butts and the the sunglasses located at the crime scene. Police began interviewing Rachel's friends and family and trying to build a picture of course of why anyone would want to murder her. At this point they couldn't rule out that the murder had been perpetrated by someone close to Rachel so with protocol they investigated Andre Hanscombe to see if there had been any motive for him to murder Rachel although he was quickly ruled out of the crime and you know they were able to determine pretty quickly that Andre was not the person that murdered Rachel. Police also looked into the background of sex offenders that were known to be in the area as well as any potential suspects that were in the area around the time of Rachel's murder, although at the time this did not yield anything significant. However, investigations into local men in the area did yield one lead into a man named Colin Stagg who a number of people had reported seeing in the local area around the time of Rachel's murder. And in August of 1993, this British man Colin Stagg was arrested for the murder of Rachel Nichol and this arrest was based solely on psychological profiling as well as information obtained from a covert police operation named Operation Edsel. Operation Edsel consisted of an undercover police officer being given the false name Lizzie James and she was instructed to basically contact Colin Stagg and try and obtain evidence that he had been the one that murdered Rachel Nichol and so she spent five months contacting Colin in over 40 letters with each letter being more explicit than the last because the other kind of piece to this operation was of course that it was deemed and aimed to be somewhat sexually motivated. As I said the police did have a theory that the murder was sexual in motivation and so with the operation they believed that if they targeted Colin in a sexual light they were more likely to get information from him about the murder. Colin was a bit of a loner and of course as I said he matched the psychological profile that was produced. This is why he became a target of Operation Esdal. They did not at the time have any evidence placing him at the crime scene other than a couple of witness accounts and his reputation in the local area. By the end of this five-month operation Lizzie was practically demanding that Colin confess to Rachel's murder in return for sadomasochistic sex. I think I butchered that word, but yes. So she would tell Colin things like, it would not matter to me if you had murdered her. In certain ways, I wish you had. It would make things easier for me. Also things like, it would have been great if you had done it. I wish you had done it. It's a turn on to think about a man that did that. And Colin still insisted that he did not participate in Rachel's murder. He even told her that he could have lied to her and said that he had done it purely in order to be with her but he didn't as I said like she was very she was pushing him in a very sexual way and kind of manipulating him into believing that if he confessed to this murder that in return she would give him this sexual relationship but Colin did not confess to anything and he was adamant that he was not 
a perpetrator in this crime. Despite this, as I said, Colin was still arrested in 1993 and he was held in custody for around a year before the judge threw out the case in 1994. The judge refused to put the undercover officer's evidence through court and the judge stated that the police had tried to incriminate the suspect by deceptive conduct of the grossest kind. Colin Stagg, despite the fact that his case was thrown out of court by a judge, was still forced to live in the shadow of this murder and he claims that he was left unemployable after the whole case and his arrest. Of course, although the judge had thrown out the case, they still hadn't found the person that did perpetrate this murder, nor had they really discussed in detail the fact that they didn't have any evidence against Colin Stagg. So to the public, it kind of just looked like they had a suspect and they were not able to prosecute him. It, it, I don't think it was portrayed to the public that this man was innocent. However, in 2008, Colin was actually awarded £700,000 in compensation from the Home Office in the UK. And again, despite all of this, Colin still had to live with the fact that a lot of people still believe that he was the perpetrator of this crime. Even after Colin had been cleared of the murder of Rachel Nichol, the case's lead detective still continued to promote his theory that Colin Stagg was guilty. The lead detective of the case was actually quoted saying, saying in 2001, Colin Stagg has been through a version of justice, albeit truncated, and he has been found not guilty. But I wonder whether he can actually say, hand on heart, that he believes people will meet him in the streets and believe that. I do not believe the system served anybody that particular day. So, of course, when you have the lead detective of the case saying these things, of course it left Colin in quite a bad position after his case was thrown out. People still believe that he was guilty and police did not have any other alternatives at this point. The undercover officer of the Operation Esdell actually also received a compensation payout of £125,000, although this payment was widely criticised as Rachel's son had only received a payout of around £22,000, which of course is less than a quarter of the payment that was given to the undercover detective and a lot of people believe that that money was more deserved to go to Rachel's son than a police officer who although was under the instructions of someone above her still to a certain extent made a choice in committing those actions as an undercover officer but that is just as debated um, kind of around the case. The criminal psychologist also involved in the investigation was charged with criminal misconduct by the British Psychological Society but in 2002 further action was dismissed. Of course after all of this, police were actually just back at square one. They had no evidence for anyone else and no other leads, suspects. They had as much as they did the first day at this point. It wasn't until 2002 that Rachel's case was reopened and police began revisiting forensic evidence that had been found at the crime scene. Of course, by this point, it had been 10 years since Rachel's murder and there had been some advancements in forensic technology and so they thought it'd be a good idea Idea to reanalyze that evidence and see if it yielded any new results. And actually, in 2004, a DNA match was found between forensic evidence collected from the crime scene and a man named Robert Knapper. Robert Knapper was a man born on February 25th, 1966, and he had a history of mental illness and violence. And he had been previously convicted of manslaughter in 1995 for killing a woman named Samantha Bissett and her daughter Jasmine. Robert was detained for many years under the Mental Health Act at a Broadmoor hospital in the UK which is a well-known high security mental hospital in the UK which houses some of the most dangerous criminals in the UK that are suffering from mental illness. Napper had also been previously diagnosed as having Asperger's syndrome and schizophrenia. At the time that the police had made the match between the DNA at the crime scene and Robert Napper he was already in custody for the murder of Samantha and her daughter so Robert Napper was arrested and charged with the murder of Rachel Nichol. In December of 2007, after previously denying all charges against him, Robert Knapper finally confessed to the murder of Rachel Nichol. However, in January of 2008, Robert actually pleaded not guilty to the murder of Rachel Nichol and the trial began on November 11th of 2008, although only one week later, Robert actually changed his plea to guilty of the murder of 
Rachel Nichol on the grounds of diminished responsibility due to his mental health conditions. The evidence against Robert Napper was undeniable and substantial in terms of forensic evidence directly linking him to the crime scene. His DNA was identified on Rachel's body and clothing, as well as other forensic evidence including fingerprints, footprints and other trace evidence linking Napper to the crime scene. A pattern of behaviour was also seen between the murders of Rachel Nichol and Samantha Bissett and her daughter. The two murders were equally brutal with both women being stabbed multiple times and the whole scene just being highly brutal. Samantha and Rachel both showed signs of sexual assault and the cases were just similar in many ways so the fact that he had already been charged for Samantha Bissett and her daughter's murder definitely played into his conviction of Rachel Nichols murder as well. Although the one difference I say that stuck out to me quite a lot was the fact that in the case of Samantha Bissett her daughter had actually also been murdered versus in Rachel Nichols case her son was spared and there's no answer as to why this was the case why he decided to murder Samantha's daughter but not Rachel's son however he was found guilty of the murder of Rachel Nichol and he was ordered to be detained indefinitely in a high security psychiatric hospital as I said he had a lot of mental illness and so this was deemed kind of the best outcome for him and for public. That is all in terms of the details of this case but I thought it was super interesting to discuss just because of the kind of details and the ins and outs of the case especially surrounding the psychological profiling that led to Colin Stagg's arrest and wrongful time in custody that he had spent. I actually study psychology at university which is why I think this is also super interesting to me because profiling is definitely a large part of forensic psychology but this is a good example of how it can be used in a negative way and shouldn't always be taken at face value as much as you can definitely develop a psychological profile. It is not always guaranteed to be correct or to lead to a positive outcome and I know this is not the only example of where psychological profiling has been used and not had the outcome of actually identifying the correct perpetrator and I think that it's so sad that for Colin Stagg he had to suffer so many years of scrutiny under kind of having responsibility for this crime that he had absolutely nothing to do with purely because he matched a psychological profile and was targeted by this police operation which was basically a honey trap operation and was wrongfully pursued I would say. But regardless the real perpetrator of this crime is locked up. Although it's definitely scary to think about this kind of crime that can happen in the public where for Rachel it seems like she was just in the wrong place at the wrong time to run into this person who was mentally unstable and probably would have murdered anyone that had walked along that path that fit his description of a victim. But I hope you enjoyed this video and this case. As always, leave your thoughts down below and I will look through some of the cases you guys have sent in, um, start to develop some research for those and hopefully the next video should be one of the cases that has been suggested to me by one of the viewers. So that is super exciting, but I will see you in in the next video please like and subscribe if you enjoyed and I'll see you next time